does it mean to be treatment resistant when it comes to anxiety? That's what I'm talking about today. I'm going to define four terms for you, treatment resistance, treatment refractory, medication intolerance, and target symptoms. I'm Dr. Tracy Marks, a psychiatrist, and I make mental health education videos. We usually refer to treatment resistance when we talk about other disorders like schizophrenia and depression. And with those disorders, treatment resistance is failing to respond adequately to two medications used at different times. So you take one and it didn't work well enough or at all, and then you take another one and still no luck. But it's a little different with anxiety. With anxiety, some experts consider treatment resistance to mean that you fail two rounds of medication and a course of cognitive behavior therapy. Actually, the more effective treatment for anxiety is cognitive behavior therapy when it's delivered properly. But the more common treatment that people get is medication. Why? because therapy is time intensive, which is usually weekly, and not everyone can afford to spend $100 or more per week if your insurance doesn't cover it. And then there's the issue of finding a therapist trained to do CBT. Here's the gist of CBT. CBT approaches your anxiety from three angles. One is your physical response to anxiety, like chest tightness or nausea. You learn exercises to reduce those symptoms, such as deep breathing from your diaphragm, or progressive muscle relaxation, just as an example. A second component is correcting faulty thinking that keeps your anxiety going, like decatastrophizing your expectations or challenging inaccurate assumptions. Then a third component is changing the things that you do to cope with anxiety, like avoiding things. I talk about avoidance in my video on safety behaviors. Exposure therapy with response prevention teaches you how to allow yourself to face the feared object or situation and manage your anxious feelings without engaging in the compulsive rituals that you would normally use to reduce your anxiety. Exposure can also serve to desensitize you to things like avoiding social criticism if you have social anxiety or internal sensations if you have health anxiety. CBT has been well studied and shown to be superior over medication, but the results depend on the skill of the therapist delivering the treatment and your commitment to completing the exercises, and using the techniques on your own. So if you don't do well with therapy, it's more like you have a pseudo resistance because other factors kept you from benefiting and it's not because you're such a difficult case that you can't be helped. Medication treatment is much more accessible because you don't always have to see a psychiatrist. It's fairly common for primary care doctors to prescribe medication for anxiety. The first choice of medications used is selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors like Prozac and Lexapro. And then the serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors like Effexor and Cymbalta. Benzodiazepines like Klonopin and Xanax are used at the beginning while you're ramping up on the antidepressant, but they're not recommended for long-term use because of their habit-forming potential and their long-term effects on slow thinking when you take them regularly for years. It's like they make you not as sharp. If we go back to using medication treatment resistance for depression as a reference, it's a failure to respond to an adequate trial of two antidepressants. What's an adequate trial? It's six to eight weeks at a dose that's usually higher than what you would use to treat depression. For example, a typical depression dose of Prozac is 40 to 60 milligrams. Some people can get better on less, but this is the most common range. Usually anxiety responds better to 60 to 80 milligrams. I've seen people who've come to me saying that their medication doesn't work. Their family doctor started them on Prozac and they've been taking 40 milligrams for the past six months. In this case, it's not a treatment failure until you've tried a higher dose, especially if the lower dose helped a little, but not enough. If that's the case, you should expect that if you increase the dose, you'll see an improvement. Another way you can experience a pseudo failure or the appearance that nothing is working is if you have to stop taking a medication because of side effects. These medications can cause a lot of nausea or weight gain, or sexual side effects. If you've taken six different medications that all cause problems for you that made you stop them, you're not treatment resistant. We call this medication intolerance when you can't reap the benefits from a medication because the side effects get in the way. Medication intolerance can be a reason that you can't find a medication that works, but it doesn't mean your anxiety is treatment refractory. Refractory means the condition doesn't respond to the expected treatments. We generally use refractory 
to refer to the condition and resistant to refer to the patient response to the treatment. But sometimes people just use the terms interchangeably. How do you know if the medication is working? What do you look for? Sometimes it's hard to tell when you've got a lot going on. The way you tell is to focus on target symptoms. Target symptoms are the things that you notice that are not right with you. You wanna look at the way you feel physically and emotionally, what you're thinking about, and the things that you do that are a deviation from your usual. Write these things down, preferably in a journal or something that you can keep and refer to later. Also, think about how often you have these experiences. You may say, I have no idea. Well, start with, does it happen daily? Does it happen multiple times a day? Is it frequent enough to happen weekly or is it more like a few times a month? And you're estimating, you don't have to be exact. But once you have a sense of how often you have these symptoms, you can then see if the symptoms lessen in frequency or intensity after you start the medications. Here's an example. Let's say on most mornings you feel fine, but maybe once a week or so, you wake up feeling on edge with a headache from grinding your teeth during the night. You work remotely at home and sudden loud sounds like your neighbor banging the trash can or a car honking startles you. But then you can't seem to come down from that state and you spend hours irritated and unfocused. If you're really aggravated, you feel chest pain. Every night you have trouble falling asleep before midnight because of feeling wired or, and worrying about things. Notice how I laid that out. I started with how you wake up, what your daytime experiences are like, and then what it's like at bedtime for you. If you think about your day like that, you can identify how your target symptoms look throughout the day. So from this example, here are your target symptoms. Morning anxiety, experienced as mental and physical tension and sometimes headaches, attacks of irritability and poor focus triggered by loud, unexpected sounds, trouble falling asleep with worry. I start you on Lexapro 5 milligrams, which is a very low dose, but since people with anxiety are more prone to feel more anxious when you start the medicine, it's best to ease you onto the medicine with a low dose. My target dose for you is 20 milligrams, but sometimes people with anxiety need 30 to 40 milligrams. If you have a positive response to the Lexapro, you may notice that you go a couple of weeks without a headache in the morning. If you do have one, you can barely feel it. Looking back over your month, you remember that your neighbor was doing some very loud yard work, but you don't even remember it bothering you. You still have trouble falling asleep, but you do have nights where you feel sleepy around 10 p.m. It's not every night, but a few nights out of the week, and those few nights are improvement. Because we all can have some amount of normal reactionary anxiety, I think it's hard to judge just how much your medication should be doing for you. I usually tell patients not to expect to be anxiety free because there will always be something that can wind you up. But with normal everyday anxiety reactions, the anxiety shouldn't interfere with your daily functions. So I think a best case scenario is that the medication brings the intensity and frequency of your anxiety experiences down several levels to where you can still function in your usual way. But then you need to implement other cognitive, behavioral, or lifestyle practices to manage the remaining symptoms that are still present even though you're taking medication. Using the previous example, that may mean integrating breathing and meditation exercises into your evening wind down to help you sleep, or journaling to address your worry thoughts. Take a look at this video that talks about how to manipulate your vagus nerve to reduce anxiety, and this video on why antidepressants can make you feel worse at first when you first start taking them. And that video explains why people with anxiety should start at a lower dose of antidepressant. Thanks for watching. See you next time.